Hello and welcome to this Red Gaming Tech video, myself Marta, where as always I'm here with the latest from the tech world in the last 24 or so hours. Today we are going to kick things off with something rather interesting from Microsoft, which you may have heard of before by the name of Variable Rate Shading. Now if this name rings a bell, it's because a while back we heard rumours that we would be seeing Navi's variable rate shading on the Xbox Scarlet and PS5, and now Microsoft have announced that DX12 is going to be getting broad hardware support for VRS. Now they do have quite a nice explanation of what variable rate shading actually is, for those of you who might not be in the know. Now their full blog post is going to be in the description below this video, it is rather lengthy, I'm not going to go through all of it here because I'll be here until Christmas but I'm of course going to discuss the highlights. So let's talk about what VRS is and why it's actually pretty exciting. And he said, quote, in a nutshell, it's a powerful new API that gives developers the ability to use GPUs more intelligently. For each pixel in a screen, shaders are called to calculate the colour this pixel should be. Shading rate refers to the resolution at which these shaders are called, which is different from the overall screen resolution. A higher shading rate means more visual fidelity, but more GPU cost. A lower shading rate means the opposite, lower visual fide fidelity Excuse me, that comes at a lower GPU cost. Traditionally, when a, a developer set a game's shading rate, this shading rate is applied to all pixels in a frame. There's a problem with this. Not all pixels are created equal. VRS allows developers to selectively reduce the shading rate in areas of the frame where it won't affect visual quality, which lets them gain performance in their games. This is really exciting because extra performance means increased frame rates and lower spec hardware being able to run better games than before. VRS also lets developers do the opposite, use an increased shading rate only in areas where it matters most, meaning even better visual quality in games. On top of that, we designed VRS to be extremely straightforward for developers to integrate into their engines. So in short, the sort of TLDR of that is you, know, you could have a basic image like say a field with a single tree in the center, just, just to give you a very basic image. So they could do two things. They could use variable rate shading to decrease the shade resolution of, sorry, the shading rate, excuse me, of the background, so the grass and perhaps the trees that are in the, you know, the other bits that are in the background, that sort of thing. Or they could use it to make the tree look even better, that thing that your eye is naturally going to be drawn towards while having the rest not be as detailed and still have a really nice looking image. So this is a really interesting technology, to be honest. It's obviously not going to set the world on fire, but it is definitely interesting, and is obviously one of the ways where we're going to be sort of seeing developers get a look, developers, excuse me, get a little bit clever with how they actually do the graphics for their games to squeeze that extra little bit of performance, those few extra frames, especially when we're talking about console as well. And if the rumours and speculation about the next-gen consoles having variable rate shading is actually true, that can be pretty huge in my opinion because, well, one of the things that I've harped on, and I'm not by no means the only one, is the fact that I kind of dislike this push towards 4K on consoles, I'd much rather see a push towards better frame rate, and if we did have VRS being implemented, that would be, of course, one way they could do it without, of course, just stacking the hardware to the point where the thing would cost over a thousand dollars, which obviously would not be good for anybody. So, very interesting stuff. There is way more about this, exactly the nitty gritty, how it works, how it's supported, all this other stuff, so go check out the link in the description below if you want to give it a read. Now, very, very quickly, speaking of this sort of thing, I have a very quick tweet from Video Cards that I want to discuss, which basically says, new ray tracing for Pascal. And you may recall that NVIDIA are at GTC, so by the time this video is uploaded, perhaps they would have announced something about ray tracing for Pascal. At present, there is no news, but I would not expect to be surprised to see something later on today. Anyway, we're going to move over from now to our next topic, which is actually regarding AMD. And this is another piece of very interesting technology that is sort of another change that AMD are making in the sort of core philosophy by how they actually design their processors. Now, of course, we've talked a lot about Moore's Law and how we aren't seeing silicon progress at the insane pace that we saw previously. And we have seen both Intel and AMD take steps to try and work with this reality. 
and they did reveal that being AMD, of course, at the recent Rice Oil and Gas HVC conference that they have their own 3D stacking initiative underway. Now, of course, Intel recently did announce its Foveros 3D chip stacking technology during its recent architecture day. And what we saw there is a 10nm CPU and an IO chip, which was mated with TSVs or through silicon via, that connect through the die through vertical electrical connections in the center of the die. And we're kind of seeing AMD do something a little bit similar here. They are also turning towards 3D chip stacking techniques, as we are going to be seeing new designs that use 3D stacked DRAM and SRAM on top of its processors in order to improve performance. And this was discussed by the AMD SVP and GM Forrest Norod. And he basically said that they have been trying various different things to sort of find their ways around the challenges of the fact that frequency improvements have obviously reached a point of diminishing returns where it's not really getting, it's not something they can lean on anymore. It's a bit of a crutch, like it was, it was a bit of a crutch before, should I say, and they can't really rely on it as much as they used to. And obviously density is kind of reaching a point where it can't really de decrease, um, increase anymore, should I say just due to te technological restrictions. And he said, quote, the dirt dirty little secret in the industry though, over the last 10 years it has stopped when we met, we now be regressing as we continually shrink our processes now. We don't get any more frequency and really with this next node, without doing extraordinary things, we get less frequency. So again, what we are seeing AMD do here is stacking SRAM and DRAM memory directly on top of a computing component like a CPU or a GPU in order to just free up more bandwidth and and of course that all important performance without worrying too much about density as well. And we are seeing sort of similar technique to what Intel did with their 3D stacking here with you know the memory and the processor placed on top of each other and then connected through those vertical TSV connections that then mate directly together. Now this direct connection is important because it increases performance and also reduces power consumption. Now unfortunately he didn't go into any specifics or mention any particular processors or GPUs that would be using this technology, but I would not be surprised to see it at all in the sort of next iteration. Not obviously the ones that are out soon, that's ridiculous, but although saying that, it be something they decided to pop out now, but I'll be surprised. Regardless of all that, we're going to be seeing it at some point soon and is obviously a pretty big change for AMD. We have seen all all the bigger players, both CPU and GPU, try to make their way around this limitation, and it does seem Intel and AMD have come kind of come across a similar solution here. Now, I've pretty much just given you the cliff notes of what Forrest Narod had to say. There is a full conference linked in the description below this video. Go check it out if you want to see exactly what he had to say. And speaking of AMD, we actually have one more thing from them today, and that is actually regarding the recently named spoiler vulnerability. Now, I'm sure you guys have heard all about this, but the TLDR is that researchers at Worcester Polytechnic Institute in the US and the University of Lübeck in Germany discovered yet another speculative execution vulnerability which was similar to Spectre but different enough that the recent mitigations for Spectre and Meltdown actually had no effect on the floor. And I've got a bit of a quote here from their findings which reads, quote, we have discovered a novel micro-architectural leakage which reveals critical information about physical page mappings to user space processes. The leakage can be exploited by a limited set of instructions which is visible in all Intel generations starting from the first generation of Intel Core processors independent of the OS and also works from within virtual machines and sandbox environments. And we have had a recent confirmation from AMD that Spoiler does not impact Ryzen, which for those of you who have a Ryzen uh, CPU inside your machine, you can uh, breathe a sigh of relief a little bit here. As we have a bit of a statement here, it reads, quote, we are aware of the report of a new security update called, sorry, exploit, excuse me, called Spoiler, which can gain access to partial address information during load operations. We believe that our products are not susceptible to this issue because of our unique processor architecture. The Spoiler exploit can gain access to partial address information above address bit 11 during load operations. We believe that our products are not susceptible to this issue because AMD processors do not use partial address matches above address bit 11 when resolving load conflicts. Now the researchers pretty much did find that AMD and ARM based processors were not susceptible, at least in the same way as Intel's processors. So basically AMD have confirmed, yep, 
you're all set. You're all safe. But speaking of Intel, we're actually going to move on to our final topic of the day with them as we have a little bit of an update with Cooper Lake. As we had a very interesting announcement from Intel's Jason Waxman over at the Open Compute Project Global Summit this year who has basically announced that Facebook, of all people, are working with Intel in order to develop upcoming Cooper Lake server CPUs. And the civics of what Facebook are actually working on here with Intel is something by the name of BFloat16, which is a 16-bit floating bit representation. So basically what we are seeing here is a touch of machine learning being brought in to Cooper Lake here. Now, of course, we don't know the extent that Intel, sorry, Intel, Facebook, I mean to say, got involved here, but it is still interesting to see Facebook use their expertise in what some might argue is a little bit of an unexpected fashion but still that is me done for this video thank you so much for watching as always your support is highly appreciated and i'll see you next time bye bye